You know, um, one of the guys on my team sent me an article the other day, and it was really pretty wild. I'm going to do a whole YouTube video about it. And it was an article talking about how conventional egg consumption increases the susceptibility of LDL to oxidation. And it's this idea that conventional eggs from chickens fed corn and soy have a decent amount of linoleic acid. So it doesn't really matter where you get it from. And look, an egg is better than a seed oil, but like conventional egg consumption increases the susceptibility of LDL to oxidation. That is wild. And now, to be fair, a wild chicken is going to eat bugs and grubs and not as many high linoleic acid grains. That egg is going to be much lower in linoleic acid. But this is one of the conundrums that I see with eggs is that eggs are great for humans, but today it's really hard to find a good egg. So it's just the point is, and this is to, this is just looping back to what I was saying just a moment ago is that I think for us to be healthy, it's important to really understand all the sources of linoleic acid. And for a lot of people, and this is one of the most unpopular things I've ever said, Jay, but I think I've heard you guys echo it on your podcast is that like even pork fed corn and soy and chicken fat, like these are not necessarily healthy things to make the majority of your diet. Is bacon better than seed, than canola oil? Yes. It's bacon is better than canola oil. Bacon is better than soy, soybean oil. Yes. It's probably not a great thing to have the majority of your fat coming from lard, which is going to be sometimes 15, 20% linoleic acid, which is getting close to canola oil. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, again, it's great that there's been such the, such a focus on seed oils, but yeah, let's not forget nuts and seeds themselves, which are really high in the polyunsaturated fats. They're just as high because that's where the oils come from. And let's not forget the chicken and pork where they're eating those seed oils partially to make them fat. Um, you know, before, before they were marketed to us humans as health foods, they were used just to fatten up the livestock until, you know, now they can do both fatten up the livestock and the human population. But Chicken and pork will be just as high in polyunsaturated fat, sometimes 30 plus percent. And as you said, the eggs from the chickens as well. So if we're going to eat chicken and pork, I would only have lean cuts unless you know that it's not fed high hoofa food, unless you know what it's eating, you know that it's not just pastured, but that it's also not being given any high hoofa foods. And there are some really great places that are testing their pork and showing that it's low hoofa. And so the, if you're going to eat any fatty chicken or pork, I would be making sure it's from those sorts of sources. And if not, I would stick to the lean ones because, yeah, that's just as much a source of omega-6s of, of PUFA as, as the seed oils. And it all accumulates. I was recently in Australia. I went to Byron Bay. I want to give a shout out to a butcher there in a farm called Locavore. If you guys are in Byron Bay, go check out Locavore. I went to their farm. They have amazing highland cattle, but I got to see their pastured pork. And it was amazing. Their pork were literally on a green patch of grass. Like you would see pig, like cows on. They had one patch of grass for cows, which were highland cattle. And we can put a picture of Highland cattle in the YouTube so people can see that's an amazing, it's an amazing type of cattle. It's the type, it's the type of cow that's on like the hardened soil website front page. It's like this beautiful, hairy cow with the big horns. Um, but the pasture next to the Highland cattle is pastured pigs. And they have this little house for the pigs that they live in, but then they move the house every day. So the pigs are rooting around in the grass. They're, they're getting bugs, they're getting worms, and they'll give them table scraps and they give them sprouted wheat but that's lower in linoleic acid than corn and soy and they're sprouting the wheat. And so they are feeding them some grains, but they're thinking about what grains they're feeding them. And they're not just pumping corn and soy into these, into these, these pigs. And so I did eat that pork, but that was the first pork that I had eaten in years, Jay, years because of these issues. But let's talk about fish oil for a moment. And then I want to transition to some gut issues. So I think fish oil is overconsumed, but fish oil is also a PUFA. What's going on here? Yeah, I, I agree that it's overconsumed. Uh, I so if we're going to compare omega threes to omega sixes, there's a couple of key differences. One, omega threes are typically less stable, more unsaturated with more double bonds, meaning that they're more susceptible to oxidation not only when they're on the shelf but also when they're in our tissues. So that's one difference. The other is they produce different icosanoids, which is the main reason why people have a different view of omega threes from omega sixes where the omega-6s are considered to have inflammatory icosanoids, whereas the omega-3s are considered not to be inflammatory or to be anti-inflammatory. We can come back to that. However, on the basis that the worst part of the omega-6s is, is the permeability and susceptible, susceptibility to peroxidation, both, again, on the shelf, in our digestive systems, in our blood, and in our tissues, the omega-3s are that and worse because they are more susceptible to peroxidation. 
And so when looking at these uh, studies involved in the membrane pacemaker theory of, of living, or of aging, which is the, the, uh, what I was mentioning earlier with the different levels of polyunsaturated fats and how that affects lifespan and aging and health, the omega-3s are worse typically because they have more double bonds and they're more, they lead to more permeability and more susceptibility to oxidation than the omega-6s. And we, if we just take fish oil, we see it very clearly there. Most fish oil is already oxidized on the shelf in levels beyond what's supposed to be regulatory standards. When we consume it, there are studies showing that just the digestive system alone will increase peroxidation su substantially. And then we can look at studies looking at pharmaceutical grade fish oil in the triglyceride form. We can look at it in cod liver oil. We can look at it with antioxidants and you still see increased levels of lipid peroxidation and some, and especially worse disease processes when you see this play out over time in animals. Uh, you see the lipid peroxidation in humans. And when you look at this in animals and you look at animals that are given higher levels of omega-3s, it shortens their lifespan and it increases lipid peroxidation and it interferes with mitochondrial respiration. So the, I think the omega-3s are next. They're the next seed oil or fish oil is the next seed oil. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's, if we're concerned about all those things with omega-6s, we should be that much more concerned with the omega-3s. Uh, and that means not only fish oil supplements, but also fatty fish like salmon. Uh, there are a couple of varieties that are a bit leaner and aren't going to have quite as much of the omega-3s. But in general, if we're going to eat seafood, I would lean toward much leaner seafood that's going to be very low in omega-3.